Welcome to a Practice Pro CPD, brought to you by LawPro. Today, uh, the topic is claims risks for commercial lawyers acting on the purchase or sale of a business. And this is an area that LawPro does see from time to time. And so what uh, we'll do today is uh, I'll be reviewing uh, what LawPro does generally and, and frame how it is that we come to see the risks in this area. And then we'll go into those risks. We'll talk about the things that we're seeing, uh, not just generally, but also some of the added risks that we're beginning to see uh, materialize due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'll then turn to some of the tips to avoid uh, errors uh, in the in acting for purchasers or vendors of businesses and leave you with some practice resources. So let's start with just the 101 about LawPro. I know that you know who we are. Uh, of course, we're your insurer. We're a full-fledged licensed insurance company. Uh, we're separate from the Law Society of Ontario, but we were created by the Law Society as a policy matter. Uh, in Canada, the uh, pub public policy uh, bargain for independent regulation is that there should be insurance for all those who are in private practice delivering services uh, to the public. And that's good for lawyers who are protected and able to go out and provide advice in areas uh, where there is complexity and where there is risk. Uh, but there, it's also good for the public, obviously, to know uh, that if there are errors or omissions, there there is uh, an insurer behind the work. Uh, we're governed by the Financial Services Regulatory Authority. We're governed by uh, Ontario's Insurance Act and the OCA. Uh, we're a regulated industry, and uh, we provide insurance now to, uh, the slide says over 27,000. It's now closer to 28,000 lawyers. Uh, you'll know us primarily for our uh, our errors and omissions, professional liability coverage, uh, but we do have other products that we offer. Uh, we do have, uh, for example, uh, title insurance through Title Plus and excess insurance as well. So because we're the mandatory insurer, we see all of the claims that come in and it's that data that allows us uh, to present on the most common uh, claims. Uh, so first, here's a, here's a myth I'd like to start with. Um, you know, sometimes when you graduate law school, you think I, I've got to be perfect, and and uh, if people are unhappy with me, then that's somehow a, a problem for me. And, and the truth is, is that yes, mistakes happen, uh, and we're all human, and we should recognize that. But even the best of the best make mistakes. And uh, as it turns out, when we go through our numbers of those currently in private practice. 42% uh, of us have had at least one claim reported to LawPro. And so it, to err is human, but also there's a, a, a part of being a, a service provider where you will receive complaints. And some of those may be with merit, some of them may not be with merit. And so it is just part of practice to have to work with the insurer and to potentially report claims. So let's be clear here, there's no shame in having to report to LawPro. Uh, there is nothing, uh, there, there should be no stigma about reaching out to us and um, let's just uh, uh, leave it at that. So a few uh, basic background pieces about, uh, about general claim statistics. Um, and this probably comes as a surprise uh, to no one that it takes some time for errors to percolate. Uh, it takes some time after uh, the sale or purchase of a business, for example, for people to realize that, oh, there are issues in how this transaction uh, closed and I did not anticipate that I would be on the hook for X, Y, or Z. And it's only after two to three years on average that these things come back and there is a report, a claim made by a lawyer to LawPro about an issue with the service that they've provided. Now, most claims are actually occurring for lawyers in the six to 25 years in practice. And uh, for many of us, that was counterintuitive. Uh, I would have thought initially that it would be the, the uh, junior lawyers without a uh, full understanding of files who would be the most likely uh, to have issues. But it, it turns out that most lawyers who are in, so, who are in the early years of practice either are 
uh, self-regulating the complexity of the cases they're taking on and making sure that they are uh, carefully growing their practice into areas of increasing complexity over time uh, and having, uh, having you know, more experience with different types of files. Or they're working in a larger firm setting or in a firm where they're not a solo practitioner and they're working with someone who's mentoring. And so what they're seeing is that uh, they're learning at the hip of another lawyer, but if there is a claim with respect to the, the, uh, the delivery of a service, the claim will likely be reported by the senior lawyer on the file. And so uh, there's this umbrella where the junior associate is protected uh, from, from uh, the issues uh, because they are working underneath uh, a more senior counsel. Now, there is no uh, sensitivity by geography. We sometimes have questions from, you know, people uh, outside of the GTA. Are we uh, subsidizing the GTA? Is the GTA subsidizing Thunder Bay or Hamilton? And the answer is no. Uh, we don't see claim sensitivity by geography. To give you a full sense of, of where business lawyers and, and the errors around buying and purchasing uh, uh, businesses come into play, it's helpful to step back and look more globally at the types of claims we receive. And when we talk about claims, we don't know, we're not just talking about lawsuits, we're talking about any time that there's been an error, an omission, or uh, the lawyer has learned that there's some sort of client dissatisfaction or other level of dissatisfaction that's being reported through, perhaps a vexatious litigant on the other side of a dispute who's written to say, I'm mad at you and I'm gonna sue you, or you know, uh, some sort of red flag where you're beginning to realize that there may be an issue on a file. Though all of those can result in a report to law pro and the rules of professional conduct talk about uh, the need to uh, put us on notice and we encourage people to do so early there's certainly no harm in doing that but it's so it's not just getting sued it's not just being tagged with a lawsuit it's all these other uh, potential issues that can result in a claim and we've got nearly 3,000 of them reported just last year alone and over 4,300 that are open at the moment so we're a busy shop uh, but when you do realize that we serve over 27,000 lawyers in private practice, uh, the numbers uh, tend to make a bit more sense. We uh, covered over $80 million in claims costs uh, on average over the last few years. So it's, it's a busy place. Uh, litigation is the number one claims area. Real estate is up there. Corporate commercial is an interesting place uh, in our space because we don't have a high volume. We have about 100 and not quite 70 claims per year on average, uh, but the cost is very high. Uh, so the average cost is 9 million a year to our program. And so even though it's only the fifth largest by claims count, by the actual number of reported claims, it's the third largest. So we sometimes talk about minnows and whales in the insurance sector. Uh, you can have a lot of smaller issues, but that on volume cost, uh, but then you can have big, uh, either uh, rare occurrences that are significant, and you can see that uh, corporate commercial claims, they're, they're not minnows, they're not whales, but they are a bit larger than one would expect uh, based on the claims count, and so uh, the severity is slightly higher. And franchise law is an area that we really need to focus on as well when we're talking about buying or selling a business because this is a regulated uh, type of business opportunity and uh, it, the Arthur Wishard Act applies and there are all sorts of particular uh, wrinkles around franchise law claims. And so even though there are few and far between, we had nine last year, uh, the cost uh, when there is an issue is very significant. Uh, we're talking uh, over a million dollars per year on, on covering these nine or so claims. And so we're seeing a six figure uh, payout where there is uh, liability or where there is exposure. Uh, $150,000 per claim is, is uh, not small change. Now, when we look at the types of of claims that are reported and then the types of losses, uh, you'll see on this slide uh, the types of uh, 
the, 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 the types of issues that we see globally. And this is by count. This is by number of claims coming in. The next slide I'll show you will show by cost and you'll see some variation. But what's important here is that, you know, when we graduate law school, we tend to think really carefully and get really scared about making mistakes in law. But that's in purple here. And you can see that actual mistakes around the interpretation of law, getting the law wrong for a client, that's about 14% of the claims we see. Most of the claims are around communication, time management, and investigation, around discussions with clients and there being ambiguities or misunderstandings, around missing deadlines, around not fully understanding your case. And so when you really strip it back, most of the errors that are reported are around what we would describe as client service matters and practice management matters, and not really about the uh, skill and judgment of lawyers in applying the law. And so uh, you can see on these numbers, 29, 19, and 19 for communication, time management, in inadequate investigation, well over half of the claims. When we look at them by cost, again, you can see most of the claims by cost are significantly related to those service areas. So communication, time management, inadequate investigation, lead the pack. Error of law trends slightly up. You can see on the last slide, 14% uh, by count becomes 18%. Nothing to scoff at, still important. Uh, but lawyers go to their CPD and they stay on top of the law and they're usually pretty good at applying it correctly. And so really most of the issues relate to the service delivery of the actual legal services. In corporate, you're gonna see some rather significant changes from the previous pie chart. You can see that in the blue and the red, communication and time management, when we start to look at corporate law, it's like the communication errors have eaten the time management claims. And, you know, we don't have the full picture as to why this is, but it's likely that time management comes down in corporate law because unlike litigation, where time drives much of the process, in corporate law, timing is usually more manageable. Even if a deal is supposed to close on certain dates, usually if there's a wrinkle, if the parties are amicable, things can be negotiated. In other areas, such as in litigation, if you've missed a limitation period, that's it, you're done. And so there are lots of time management issues in, for example, plaintiff side litigation. That time management red would actually be the biggest piece of that pie. But when it comes to corporate law, time management is generally very well addressed. The errors that make up for that difference are around communication. You'll see inadequate investigation staying relatively the same at about 18%. But here too, communication and inadequate investigation combined, accounting for well over half of all of the errors. And we'll go through many of these that are in the pie chart, but you can see here again, error of law, uh, well under uh, a quarter of the cost. So rounding out the top four, but not uh, the largest by far. When we look at it by cost, uh, for the last decade, you can see here again, it generally remains the same. You'll see conflicts though do play a significant piece. They actually uh, come into tie for second with inadequate investigation. So we'll spend a bit of time today talking about conflict of interest. And conflicts here, you'll notice we're only about 12% by claim. But again, one of those areas where, where things do go wrong, the cost can be more significant. And so important for corporate lawyers in particular to keep that in mind. Now, when we look at uh, franchise law claims, bottom line is that it's communication driven. Uh, that's the issue. And you can see it uh, here again. So let's talk about uh, some of the specific claims risks and what we mean by those errors. So when we talk communication errors, here are the, the major ones. Um, failing to follow clients' instructions. Uh, what do we mean by that? Often that's where work was promised and not done, or where uh, the work was promised uh, but, uh, but was provided differently, uh, or where you fail to, uh, to really take into account that client need. Um, in wills and estates, we've actually seen cases where the client meeting has taken place, the lawyer has 
noted in their notes the client's desires, uh, but then that's uh, for whatever reason missed on on the actual drafting phase, and the client comes in, executes a will, and it actually doesn't reflect their intention. Uh, so we sometimes see that uh, in litigation. We've seen uh, cases, for example, where uh, litigation was commenced, formal litigation was commenced after an, an initial client meeting, where in fact the client thought they were coming in to understand their rights and to understand their options. They didn't think uh, that they had provided the sign-off to actually uh, pull the plug or you know commence that that action. Uh, in corporate commercial, uh, we we haven't seen much of this uh, in terms of failing to follow. Uh, what we do see though are lots of claims that are framed as a failure to obtain consent or failure to inform the client. And this is not just about not discussing an issue uh, fully, not raising a wrinkle that might have been in the in the details, but also not necessarily talking about the full implications of, of one's decisions or one's actions. Uh, so for example, uh, we see all the time in franchise law, uh, some sort of claim that there was not adequate disclosure provided uh, to a potential franchise operator, uh, that they did not understand uh, what, what what the obligations were going to be, that uh, they there should have been further pushback for further disclosure by their corporate lawyer, and that in fact that lawyer didn't fully explain the arrangement and what would be taking place. Um, you know, we sometimes see this on on purchases uh, where uh, somebody might want to buy out a partner and no one's fully explained uh, the shotgun clause that's there. Uh, and then they're left scratching their head as to how they're now in a in a different situation from what they had expected would would occur. Sometimes we just see poor communication. Uh, sometimes that's just death by a thousand cuts, where uh, from start to finish it's just a poorly documented file, poor uh, correspondence to the client, rushed correspondence to a client, no correspondence at times to a client, lots of delays followed by. Uh, you know the the anvil uh, from on high that that just drops into the client's lap with all sorts of new things with immediate needs for decision, those sorts of things that can really frustrate a client. Uh, but often in corporate commercial law, what we do see are issues where the communication is around who's looking after what. Uh, so uh, businesses have their own other experts, the financial advisors, uh, the, the accounting, the tax advisors who are trying to develop a structure. Uh, and at times there's a question about, well, who's really signing off on which part? And so if the lawyer is there uh, to ensure that uh, sale of a business occurs, is it the accountant who's gonna be advising the client on what the tax implications are gonna be, or is going to be structuring the, uh, trying to uh, recommend certain changes to the structure of the deal uh, to make sure that there are certain tax uh, implications uh, or, or that taxes are accounted for for that year. Uh, so there's often a discussion that needs to be had about who's responsible for which part and uh, which part you can reasonably rely on uh, going forward. Oh, before we move off this slide, I, I do note there that the quotes and the, the often he said, she said part of it. And, and this is simply the point that when we do get into communication errors, if there isn't contemporaneous documentation of what you discussed with a client, it makes it harder down the road for law pro to be able to defend the claim. And so we've, we've often had cases where there's no, no contemporaneous, contemporaneous note to file, no contemporaneous detailed document explaining what, what a lawyer just did, uh, no email back to a client confirming instructions after a phone call, uh, no letter after a client has come in and you've reviewed certain key terms and you've talked about certain particular things in addition to your normal, uh, your normal spiel. And without those, if there becomes a fight about what was discussed later, it's hard. Um, we're all officers of the court and the court uh, will take that into account if it does, if this is a sort of thing that goes to a trial, you know, lawyers are respected and, and you know, we're probably gonna be taken as credible generally. But when it comes to a specific recollection or a specific instance with a client, the client 
is likely going to be preferred. And part of that will depend on your client, of course, but for many of us, uh, the client dealing with the lawyer, that's, that's not your everyday. For them, that's something that stands out. That's something where they'll remember pretty well what happened uh, when they met with you. If you remember the good old days of being in person, they'll probably remember uh, where they parked, how they got into your building, uh, whether you were on time for the meeting, who else was in the room with you, what the artwork looked like, uh, how long you actually spent in the room, uh, what you discussed generally, what you discussed specifically. They'll have lots of recall. Uh, you meet hundreds of people a year, whether it's by Zoom or in person, and you may not have the same level of specific recollection. And so uh, we do see, generally speaking, that if there's no contemporaneous documentation and we're trying to reflect back and remember, we're talking about issues that may have only come to light after two to three years, and it can be years before you get to a trial date. And so with recollection getting fuzzier and fuzzier and using hundreds of more clients between when and when you wrote to LawPro to first report a, pot a potential issue and a trial date, uh, chances are uh, the recollection will not quite be there and uh, credibility could become a factor. So courts will often prefer uh, the recollection of your client over you. Um, and that's, uh, that's understandable given the dynamic of play. So in COVID, we're seeing different and new risks. Uh, we're seeing certain risks exacerbated. So let's just talk about what we're doing right now, which is uh, meeting over Zoom. Uh, there has been the shift to video conference and uh, what it does is it changes rapport. Uh, here's a simple one. I can't see you guys right now. You know, you'll be able to see your client. You should be insisting on seeing your client, but you're gonna see your client through a screen and that changes human dynamic. Some people are very comfortable with this new technology. Some people uh, are even maybe even more comfortable with a bit of distance between uh, themselves and another person. But for many, this is uh, a new experience to talk to a trusted legal advisor about ma very personal matters uh, or very important matters uh, through a, a portal where they normally, you know, FaceTime their buddies or, or what have you. Now, many people are moving to, you know, the quote unquote new normal and are getting with it and it's fine, but we shouldn't underestimate uh, how long it's gonna take for people to still feel a little uncomfortable when it comes to dealing with lawyers via Zoom. And we've been hearing that this is changing how lawyers need to conduct intake meetings or their client ID processes uh, and taking time to establish rapport with a client. Uh, that client may not be in a position to share all of their information in just one intake meeting. Even if they're able to courier documents in advance or scan them and send them to you, uh, there are all sorts of reasons why things might take longer, uh, things might require more than one meeting. Uh, when you're doing an intake, when you're talking about possibly buying or selling a business, let's think about the why behind that right now. Some people may be happily cashing out. Some people may be selling their business because they have to care for someone in their family and can no longer work the business. Some people may have just lost most of the value of their business and are trying to sell for parts or trying to sell to keep good so that somebody else can benefit from goodwill uh, related to the business once a reopening, a uh, full reopening permits. Uh, but people are possibly coming to you to sell or buy a business right now. And there may be some significant new emotional uh, experiences that they are undergoing. So if your client appears to be snippy, appears to be sad, appears to be uh, frustrated, appears to be uh, at, at all, uh, flummoxed by this, just keep in mind that there may be all sorts of underlying factors, uh, given where we are right now, that they're doing all this by video and that they may be engaging in a legal transaction that all things being equal, they rather might not have wanted to do at this particular moment in time. So it's hard to build that client empathy and that client rapport over Zoom, but just remember that we're all struggling and we're all figuring it out. There are also some 
some new risks around client ID and the Law Society has some helpful guidance around client ID and client verification requirements. Uh, you also need to be aware of different types of risks around capacity and undue influence. Uh, certainly, we can't necessarily tell who else is in the room. If you are worried about it, you can always ask your client to pick up their screen and just rotate it around. Uh, but we also need to understand that the people are living in, in new circumstances. If, if I live in a 500 square foot loft in downtown Toronto and I need some legal advice, if I'm wearing a headset and I'm talking to you through the screen and uh, someone else who I live with is reading a magazine on the couch, uh, the fact that they're there doesn't necessarily mean that I'm under undue influence. And it may not really affect confidentiality or privilege either. Uh, if they can't see my screen, if my screen's turned away, if I've got a headset in, they're not paying attention to me. So we've got to meet people where we're finding them right now. And that's, that's a key difference. I'm sure you're all seeing that as you've worked uh, to shift to work from home or to a hybrid model, that new processes uh, are required. Um, and we are shifting to video. We're spending a lot of time on video. There's a lot of Zoom fatigue, but after those meetings, we still need to document what's what we've just uh, what what we've just discussed with clients, and we need to confirm it in writing. And that could be a quick email. This is where process management can help as well, where you can sort of have a template letter uh, that describes, for example, uh, the steps you expect that will come next if you are retained uh, to act for somebody on the purchase or sale of a business. So when we talk about um, inadequate discovery of of facts, uh, we're often looking at bad advice because someone didn't dig deep enough to deal with all the relevant issues. And sometimes, uh, you know, that due diligence is rather significant. I remember being a young lawyer and realizing that the valuation of a company that I was uh, involved in the litigation on, the, the, the expert accountant had not taken into account that one of the subsidiaries had been sold three weeks ago prior to, to them being retained. You know, those are rather significant changes to valuation if you're missing some of the parts. Uh, some of the questions around uh, buying and purchasing, in, 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 there's just a lot of due diligence. Uh, if it's a restaurant, that lease is going to be really important. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a manufacturing facility, you're going to want to know if the, about, the, about the, the physical property, as well as all of the different uh, machinery, all the different things that might be subject to uh, to PSA or to 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 uh, to better understand what's owned and subject to what conditions, the financing will always be uh, important to understand. And of course, going back to those minute books, to the underlying bylaws, to the uh, to make sure that all of the uh, corporate documents are understood and all of the the ducks are lined up to uh, to be able to affect a purchase or sale. And so, you know, this is something that we see in all sorts of areas. Uh, in buying or selling a business, it's really about doing the due diligence to understand the business, understand what drives the value for the business and understand uh, what its current assets, liabilities and, and uh, the legal rights involved are. So, you know, we see this sometimes in, in corporate commercial, I'll, I'll give you some uh, examples uh, that, that, you know, are frightening but possible. One is where uh, company A buys company B, not realizing that, Company B had debt, and now Company A owns that debt as well. Uh, we've seen others where uh, uh, a predecessor corporation might have a, a, some sort of grandfathered exemption. Uh, it could be in a regulated space or elsewhere, uh, where uh, on the purchase, uh, the new entity now loses that benefit. And so uh, these are the sorts of things that people need to take into account. And, um, you know, we have seen deals where the commercial lease uh, hasn't been subject to full searches or, uh, you know, the debts and encumbrances and liens haven't been fully mapped out. Uh, and, and so, you know, those are, those are your, your due diligence 101s where if things get missed for whatever reason, uh, that can significantly impact on the deal. And again, talking about timing, when those get missed, depending on the nature of the, the missed due diligence, that's why it might take a couple of years for that to shake out. Somebody not, may not realize that. Uh, specific uh, specific property is encumbered until they want to use it for a specific purpose, for example. So again, here at the bottom of this slide, you'll see franchising popping up again. And here again, there's a question about reviewing a franchise disclosure document 
and you know adequately doing that and understanding your client's situation enough uh, to recognize what are the key pieces there uh, that may be more specific, more material to them, being able to spend that time with their client. And again, on the communication piece, uh, lots there about the back and forth around making sure that a potential franchise E understands the terms and conditions in the disclosure document. So let's spend a bit, bit of time about how COVID has shifted this up. And again, I talked about some of this earlier, but this is a good time to think, to really get to know your clients and to get to know their needs. And if there's a purchase or sale of a business right now, why are they coming and trying to do this now? Uh, for some purchasers, it may be about diversifying their business. It might be that one of their business lines is struggling in the pandemic. It may be that uh, now with credit being where it is, it's cheap. It's a good time to go on a buying uh, spree for a particular entity or for a particular uh, investor. Uh, but, you know, some are being forced to sell. And uh, that's just the reality. Uh, some are trying to get out. Some uh, people are small business owners are not able to uh, maintain uh, their lives uh, and keep things in order because of uh, the pandemic. Sometimes the business has just fundamentally shifted due to COVID. Uh, sometimes they just need uh, a strategic partner, but they're not uh, at a point in their uh, ownership isn't in 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 uh, a position where they want to be part of uh, taking the good in in a business and working with somebody else to to make it uh viable for the current uh, environment and so there are all sorts of reasons why people may be buying or selling but it's really important to to figure out what's driving a deal what's driving uh the motivation right now uh, so that you understand where they're coming from and that will help in the negotiations and let you understand um you know making sure that the art of the possible uh if if it if it makes sense to proceed can be done uh recognizing your client's key needs but also recognizing what their their key must-haves are going to be on a transaction so that you can press pause and go back to them if there are certain pieces uh that aren't going to make sense for them down the road as you're dealing with the transaction obviously timing is going to be an issue now the time management concern isn't just about us lawyers whose productivity are presumably down these days uh, where the where you know we're working from home, we're dealing with uh, with limited social circles. Our mood may be up and down depending on the day. Uh, there are family obligations, there are uh, community obligations. There's lots flying around, and so you know our own productivities and our own wellness checks have to you know consider the possibility that we might it might take a bit longer for us to be able to get through certain tasks and and for our staff as well. But that also expands out. It expands out to uh, your own clients and them getting back to you in uh, in in time. Uh, it expands out to the other side on a transaction and their clients. And so you have to think about that when trying to develop the reasonable time frame for a deal uh, and the time you'll need to make sure that you can really represent your clients with enough baked in time to communicate effectively with them about the changes or about the back and forth or about the process so that they're on the same page as you. And, uh, you know, related to that time management is that it's going to take longer potentially for some people to gather documents, to be able to scan them and send them or to provide them in any other way to you. And so you've just got to keep that in mind. On failure to apply the law, uh, you know, we're seeing obviously in corporate commercial, it's, it's under 20% uh, of what we, we see, but uh, there are substantive law errors like failing to properly secure uh, an interest uh, where the lawyer knows it's there and uh, just falls down in the paperwork. Uh, we do see uh, other issues like uh, changing legislation or regulation in particularly regulated industries. This can be significant. Um, in COVID, we're, we also have lots of rapidly changing client needs that I've discussed already, but rapidly changing laws and the need to monitor for updates. And for those of you who are uh, working with uh, workplaces, there are all sorts of changing return to work requirements. They're changing day by day. There are different uh, employee and, and labor obligations, but also around furloughs and layoffs, there have been all sorts of different changes. And lease payment programs, if you're a landlord or a tenant, there have been all sorts of rapid changes around government programs there. Lots of different changes in uh, the legal realm. It remains fluid and you're trying to help your business uh, clients in real time. Uh, so, you know, there is a bit of a greater risk that there will be mistakes made along the way. 
Conflicts of interest, uh, we mentioned already, uh, do become a significant issue in corporate commercial law from time to time. In fact, if you go and look at the key cases around conflicts uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada, they often do involve uh, law firms uh, and law firms uh, and former clients. Um, you know, we, we see this in corporate commercial law. There are risks around uh, acting for previous clients, uh, thinking that it's, it's a, a safe move uh, given the passage of time or, or given the nature of the transaction. We've seen cases where, uh, you know, the, the, the conflict might be that you're, you're working uh, for a family business uh, and you may have a pre-existing relationship with one member of the family or, uh, or may just uh, have acted on the startup of the business, uh, but now that it's a business issue, uh, the lines get a bit blurry as to whether you've, you're continuing to really act for the corporation or whether you're acting for, uh, you know, a, a main shareholder, for example. Uh, so in the in the tightly held, uh, you know, these are these are uh, uh, issues that come up from time to time. We also see issues around self-interest, uh, you know, in the dot com boom and in uh, certain startups. Uh, sometimes there are uh, novel fee. Uh, fee arrangements that are entered into and ILA is almost certainly necessary. Uh, but we also see fee disputes which pit the uh, lawyer and firm's interest at getting paid against uh, their client's interests. And uh, at times that does really, uh, it is a, a, a key pressure point. One thing we would mention is if you sue your client for fees, they probably turn around and sue you for some sort of alleged negligence. So we try to recommend that people not sue for fees wherever they can, because uh, that's often just, uh, if you're already at that situation, it's often uh, just going to add fuel to the fire. We do see conflicts on law firm mergers or lateral hires. If associate lawyer worked on this you know, M&A deal on one side of the transaction and you're acting on the other, uh, there are ethical screens and, and real questions about whether it can be done properly. Um, and you know this is a costly area, particularly for big law, where these conflicts are more uh, more frequent. And uh, certainly, uh, firms have their own um, their own mer their their own conflict screening pieces. Also, if firms are merging or if they're they're somehow shifting, uh, the conflicts can be uh, can can manifest at that point. But really, when people are looking at a potential uh, business deal or the possibility of continuing to act. Uh, the conflicts on a law merger or lateral hires are often, you know, they're just a blind spot in people's processes. So you have to keep them in mind uh, if you do have bigger files in the office and you're, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, an active transaction uh, and looking to hiring or looking to merging. Time and calendaring is, uh, as I mentioned, not a huge issue in terms of loss or claim count for corporate commercial lawyers. Uh, and, you know, missed limitation periods aren't an issue for corporate lawyers and uh, you should count yourselves very lucky as a recovering litigator. I can tell you the, the, the counting of days and it was a very daunting task. Uh, but, you know, we do see other issues that can arise. Uh, procrastination or lack of follow up is, is one that we do see across all areas. And uh, sometimes work isn't done on a timely basis. And really, there there are there's lots of literature behind why that sometimes happens and procrastination or, or delay on a task often is because uh, the lawyer or staff uh, are averse to the task, just don't like doing it. And, and we get that. We've all been there where we, we don't like doing something, but it's got to be done. Um, and there are all sorts of tricks for time management and productivity that people can take to uh, reward themselves for getting through the bad part of their day, so to speak, and keep things moving. Um, all sorts of ways that we can fight that task averseness and just say, I'm going to do the, the hardest thing first or the most annoying thing first in my day and then move on. But we also do have, uh, at times, a mental health component to this, which is that uh, a lot of the recorded uh, incidents of uh, missing a deadline or not doing work at all uh, really flow back to anxiety. And, and in those cases, it's about being afraid of making a mistake, being afraid that a supervising lawyer will see all sorts of problems and throw this work back at me, uh, being afraid that no matter what I do, it's not going to be good enough, either for the client or for a lawyer, uh, and that can lead to paralysis. And so there are things that we can do as law firms, as employers, as partners, 
to ensure that we have good communication uh, with uh, our staff and make sure that people are are you know checking in and 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 that we're checking in with each other and making sure that uh, people are uh, confident to do their work and happy to do their work or or if they're struggling that they're able to come forward and talk with us about uh, the supports they might need or the supports you might be able to provide or uh, or if need be uh, ask that somebody else assist or take over a piece uh, given given uh, given the procrastination or, or given anxieties in COVID, of course, I've talked a lot about the time management piece, but um, the bottom line in the corporate commercial space is that uh, we're all trying to meet our deadlines and our obligations while productivity is down. And, and we're not just working from home, we're working from home while working in a pandemic. And I know that that, that phrase is starting to sound a bit cliched, but I hope that it's not it's not a statement that's just rolling off our backs yet because we've got a long time to go here and it's going to be wavy in terms of how we're all feeling on any given day and how much we're going to be able to get done in any given day uh, depending on our other life factors and so we just need to keep that in mind as we're building out our to-do lists clerical and delegation errors do happen in corporate commercial law from time to time and you know this is about missed filings or not getting that uh, search done that needs to be done as part of the due diligence uh, in COVID-19 we're seeing shifts in processes shifts in how lawyers are reaching out to staff members to make sure that that uh, delegated tasks are getting done there are all sorts of ways that lawyers can work effectively remotely in teams one way is to use Microsoft Teams, where you can actually chat in real time, uh, where you can set up workflows. Uh, there's lots of product project management software. There's lots of easy ways like uh, just texting or using uh, email to make sure that everyone understands what the task is, what the next step is. And checklists, of course, are a great way to move these things forward. Uh, but of course, uh, given the shifts now, even though these aren't significantly large parts of the corporate commercial errors, uh, something to be mindful of at this particular point. So a few specific issues when we're acting on a business purchase or sale that we've seen from time to time and, and areas of the due diligence or of the transaction that need to be considered. So the first is around shareholder approval and shareholder rights. And the shareholder agreement itself may have terms in it that specifically address the sale of a business. So it's really important that we're carefully reviewing the shareholder rights and ensuring that we've got the shareholder approval for key changes. Now on related party transactions, there may be procedural issues that you as uh, a third party uh, professional advisor might need to think about. Uh, you know, if, if uh, there are independent uh, directors uh, that might uh, be well suited and ought to be uh, managing and supervising the conduct of negotiations with a related party. Um, and there may be role confusion for you. Uh, corporate lawyers at times, uh, have, we have seen cases where the corporate lawyer loves the idea of the deal, wants to help their client get the deal through, but at times the hat may shift a little bit and think, thinking more about the puzzle of how to get the deal through as opposed to what their client's rights on that deal are. And that can create a problem down the road if it turns out the transaction wasn't uh, necessarily protecting their client in the full way that they could have. Uh, and so that's just another piece. Insider trading, of course, is you know one of those heck no areas, um, but it's sometimes important for you as the lawyer advisor to remind people uh, or to um, ensure that there is advice given uh, as to why certain people in companies that are in play are not able to act on options they may have or, or otherwise uh, engage in, in insider trading. And as a lawyer who's privy to the deal and your entire staff, there are uh, prohibitions there as well. Of course, law pro wouldn't uh, necessarily be there for you if there's an insider trading allegation against you. We don't cover uh, quasi-criminal uh, and uh, and issues that do not relate to the direct provision of legal services to a third party. So one of the issues that uh, can happen, especially when people want to see a deal go through and they think that the lawyers are just a, a transaction cost, is is your client might say, well, we'd like you to to strip down what they're going to be providing. And you know that's just one example of what I call the big client error. And I, I, when we talk big client, we don't really mean just institutional anchor client who might keep your lights on, 
Um, but any client that's sort of larger than life in, in the mental capacity that they might be taking of yours, um, where there may be the, the client who may not have a big file in your office, but are, are eating up your energy and keeping you up at night. Uh, clients at times ask us to cut corners, take shortcuts, overlook conflicts of interest, uh, do things to keep, take, keep the transaction moving, keep the deal afloat, keep fees down. The bottom line is that's a significant risk area. And we've seen lawyers duped uh, where transaction one goes smoothly, transaction two goes smoothly, client comes back with the biggest fish yet, says, can you help me? Sure, corner gets cut, fraud happens, lawyers on the hook. Uh, and so, you know, some of your clients, uh, they, they might not be fraudsters per se, let's be clear, but uh, even a, a client who you have known well historically, um, you never know what their current situation is. You never know uh, where there may be new risks. So even if we're not getting up to the level of illegal activity, cutting a corner can put you at risk. Um, and there's no need for you to shift risk in, uh, in your everyday uh, delivery of professional services. So you should always uh, be willing to push back and make sure that uh, you're doing the due diligence that you see fit um, uh, as you proceed. And, you know, just talking about that fraud example, uh, that's just one of many we see. And, and in COVID, the fraudsters have come out of the woodwork and are taking advantage of uh, changes in processes, changes in systems, uh, and people's anxieties to try to leverage uh, people into making hasty decisions where money goes missing. Um, and you know, some of the recent corporate fraud efforts we've seen included, for example, uh, a long, long-standingly vacant piece of commercial property uh, where uh, someone then uh, sought a mortgage through a private lender uh, and uh, showed up at a lawyer lawyer's office, purported to be the owners, provided corporate profiles and ID, and it turned out on a driver's license search conducted by the lawyer that the ID was not actually that of the person in front of them, and they were able to avoid what could have been, uh, you know, one of these scams where somebody gets money. Uh, that's that's registered on title, uh, but where the actual person in the room uh, had uh, no stake whatsoever in the property itself. And so corporations are um, at risk of fraud and uh, on corporate transactions, you have to be careful. Uh, there are other risks uh, on purchasing and sales of businesses, and sometimes these are transnational. And it's just important to remember that while you're insured, uh, to a minimum amount, and, and some of you may consider excess insurance or your firms may already have it in place, uh, this is uh, one of the risk areas that, uh, that your clients might ask about, about uh, whether or not uh, uh, a, an American a purchaser or vendor uh, has legal services coverage. And the fact is, is that the uh, firm acting for the other side may or may not, or if your client needs an American law firm, they may or may not have insurance, and uh, that would be a risk factor for them to consider. For you personally, it's important to remember that your law pro insurance does not cover advice or work regarding American law or foreign law for that matter. Uh, and so you need to uh, keep that in mind. If you need opinions about US law, you can't be the one giving them under our policy at least. If you're, if you're called in New York State and you have insurance for New York State law, great, but we're not there for that type of uh, coverage. Um, also, for excess insurance, uh, you just want to know how it might respond to these larger deals. So I've got a few more minutes. I just wanted to let you know about the sort of wave we're seeing for COVID-related claims. And thankfully, so far, uh, we haven't been inundated, but uh, we expect that COVID is going to lead to some economic downturn. And in economic downturn, we do see uh, anxieties that sometimes lead to litigation. Uh, we've seen damages due to, to delays uh, where uh, either uh, on real estate, for example, we've seen cases where a uh, purchaser sees a change in market and wants out of the deal. Uh, and uh, then there's back and forth and possibly lost opportunity. There's been economic downturn on corporate commercial transactions where then people have tried to turn against their lawyers. Uh, we have seen a couple of errors where something gets missed um, a document isn't filed properly or goes missing uh, due to shifting office procedures. 
And we have seen some lack of clarity around uh, the current limitation periods and the emergency suspension that occurred from March to September, uh, March 16th to September 14th, and what that uh, will do for going forward. Uh, keep in mind that court procedures aren't necessar weren't necessarily suspended for that time. There were uh, different court processes in place, and some lawyers assumed that everything was frozen, but in fact, certain areas, um, construction liens, for example, were opened up earlier, and some lawyers didn't realize that and missed deadlines. So we're seeing uh, some that are economic related around lost opportunities or about trying to get out of deals, try to pin risk on others, try to blame others for losses, uh, but we're also seeing some procedural shifts uh, that are leading to claims. So here are just a few quick tips and they, they become obvious based on what we've talked about to date. But first it's, it's COVID, everyone's thinking big picture existential about what this is all gonna mean. And really you can distill that um, and focus on what your clients actually need right now and what are they looking uh, to, for you uh, to help. And you know, for those of you seeking opportunity, of course, uh, work from home, Practice is an opportunity to reduce overhead and there are potential to uh, provide for small businesses and others uh, in new ways. So there are ways that we can take this moment to reflect on how we wanna be practicing. But even if the practice itself and our client base itself is the same, it really comes down to revisiting our processes to make sure that they fit within our new ways of delivering legal services. So Atul Gawande has talked about how we've been able to save lives around the world with simple procedures, uh, simple checklists to help for surgeries that are occurring um, e even in the most remote and desperate of circumstances. Um, so if global world health can be solved through good checklists, presumably legal processes to buy and sell businesses can as well. So now's a good time to look at your file handling and make sure you've got good conflicts, good retainers that are in writing and clear as to scope and that you're following your conflict screening and not taking cutting corners. For the client management, obviously in COVID-19, there's a shift here in terms of how it might take time to work with clients, how meeting times might have to change at last minute. Um, and really you get the opportunity though to manage the client expectations from the start and talk to them about your processes and your procedures and timing and about how we'll need cushions for timing and about anticipated costs and likely outcomes and that'll help. You can't really assume that a client understands anything at this point. Um, and so it's really important to set the stage and start to manage the expectation and then to continue. Part of your client management should include regular ticklers to follow up with your clients and make sure you shouldn't just be waiting till a transaction closes to send a huge bill with a how did I do note. Uh, you'd hopefully be talking with them to make sure that if costs are trending upward, they're aware of the why and they're on board. Um, we don't like surprises. No one likes surprises these days in particular. Also, it's important to know when to say goodbye. If a client's really being problematic for reasons that, uh, that are uh, just unfair to you, uh, as long as you're not in uh, live litigation or there are other issues, uh, just remember you, uh, you get to, to say if you want to go off the record, uh, you as a service provider, uh, get to make those choices. So we've talked about the need to keep that communicate document loop, the CD loop as I call it. It just spins and spins and keeps us in a happy place. We communicate, we document, communicate, document. Uh, if you've had a phone call, document in writing. If you've had a, a, a quick Zoom chat, document in writing. Um, though that will help you make sure that you're on task. It also makes sure that your client knows uh, where things are at. And it's always uh, helpful to confirm uh, when you have done an in intake that you're not on file, uh, if that's the case, and to wrap up your retainers with a nice final reporting letter. So obviously in COVID, it's gonna take longer to dig deeper. It's gonna take more time to read between the lines and ask why the client is with you right now. What are they really expecting? What's driving the need to sell a business right now? And if there's a particular urgency to it, uh, is it a reasonable, understandable urgency or is this possibly some sort of nefarious play? It's unlikely, but you know you always have to keep fraud in the back of your mind as well. So we've talked about money, and this is another area where you get to be clear about your fee structure and client expectations can be managed from intake 
all the way to that final bill. Uh, but make sure that if you are billing, uh, you know, on a regular basis, uh, based on an hourly rate that you're being replenished regularly and don't let these be surprises to your clients. Uh, otherwise that can lead to frustration. So the lessons really are that the claims are out there, risks are real but, and risks are shifting with COVID, uh, but risks are preventable. Uh, now that you've seen sort of that communication and inadequate investigation are sort of the two big ones uh, for acting on transactions and knowing that uh, you really need to get to back to the core underlying documents whenever you're gonna be uh, acting for the purchase or sale of a business, uh, those risks can be manageable. In COVID and just generally, it's great to get to know your clients' motivations, get to know them well, uh, become their trusted advisor, not just for this, but for hopefully the long ro road. Um, and just know that, you know, right now, we need to be thinking about our processes and taking the time to make sure that uh, as we've pivoted, that the new systems are working well. So uh, you can actively manage your practice and we've got supports, uh, practicepro.ca, of course, has uh, lots out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a whole COVID page uh, that talks about some of the tips uh, for uh, providing remote practice. We have a commercial transaction checklist uh, that it bakes in some of the key communication steps and you can use this and, uh, you know, always uh, ensure that that uh, as you go through the key steps of your transaction that your client is on board with you. You can learn more about the risks by uh, checking out our newly done malpractice claims fact sheets. Uh, you can see the tips for areas of law, including litigation, corporate commercial, wills and estates, etc. cetera. Uh, our COVID and tech pages talk about video conferencing. We've got resources there. We've also got work from home tips. We actually have a a map of different types of services, uh, tech providers that you might use in your practice. We don't endorse them per se, but we wanted to give a one-on-one of the types of tools that lawyers can turn to, to manage working from home or remote practice generally. And to monitor for frauds in the corporate commercial sphere, we'd recommend downloading our corporate, uh, our real estate and cybercrime and bad check fraud sheets and going to avoid a claim subscribing there for fraud updates. Of course, I've talked a lot about wellness and mental health. The member assistance program is free to you. Bonus, it's free to your family members as well. They've just added all sorts of new resources on there. It's worth logging in and having a look-see. Lots of stuff for prevention and also to swing the vine to resources if things are a bit more serious. And uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, by uh, hearing me out today, you can now claim 50 bucks at LawPro uh, for the risk management credit, uh, having learned a bit more about your risks today. So that's everything from me today. I, I again, thank you for, uh, for uh, inviting me. So thanks again for having me.